My Vote Mackinac tonight is brought to you by ITC Holdings, the Masco Foundation, DTE Energy Foundation, PBS Chemicals, Comerica Bank, and by MGM Grand Detroit. Good evening and thanks so much for joining us for My Vote Mackinac tonight. I'm Christy McDonald. We are coming to you from the lobby of the Grand Hotel as the Mackinac Policy Conference wraps up. It has been three days of concentrating on some of the biggest issues facing the state of Michigan with business leaders, policymakers, and educators. Top stories coming out of the conference this year, education reform, how the health of Detroit affects the state, and making Michigan competitive. We'll talk about it all, plus a look at the Detroit mayoral debate from Thursday night. And join Joining me now are the editorial page editors of the Detroit News and Detroit Free Press, Nolan Finley and Stephen Henderson. Gentlemen, it's good to see you, and it good is the here. last day last is. of good. the conference. Thank Still God Almighty. Almighty. All right, so why don't you go ahead <laughs> and as we now look back and say, what are your impressions? I thought it was a good conference. I think it's high energy. You had a lot of people talking about some really important issues. I can't say we walk away from here with all sorts of solutions, but that's really not, this isn't a policy-making body. It's an idea exchange. Plenty of ideas were exchanged and a lot of good conversation for folks trying to be, bring, bring folks together on key issues. Not policy-making conference, but a lot of people who can influence those policymakers. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and I, I think we had, you know, wonderful range of them this week. Jeb Bush, uh, Michelle Rhee, uh, you know, the, the, the star quality here up here has sort of been upped in the last yeah. couple of years, and, and I think Sandy Baru de deserves a lot of credit for, for landing those people and bringing them here to tell people in Michigan, here's what's going on nationally, here's where you guys measure up, and here's how you can catch up to everybody else. Yeah, they did bring some interesting perspectives. So go ahead, Nolan, why don't you tell me, what are some of the things that stuck out uh, over the three days, those major issues that people are talking about, are, and that are going to take with them when they leave Mackinac Island? Well, I think you can't, as we talked before, you can't possibly leave this island without um, recognizing that education was elevated to a top of the priority list position for the first time since I've been coming up here. And that connection between education and business, education and the economy was front and center here. A lot of talk about workforce development talent, but also about preschool edu education. And you know, the, the, the governor and legislature put a lot of money into pre-K education into this budget. So there's, there seems to be this commitment to get a better educated Michigan. So I think that's good. I know they had some, some real conversations on the other tough issues they're facing, Medicare expansion, transportation funding. I know they had a good meeting between the governor and the and lieutenant governor and the legislative leaders. I think they made some progress on transportation. Medicaid expansion, I'm not sure they're doing as well, but it gave everybody an opportunity to sit down um, not just with each other, but with other people who have an interest in the outcome here and try to come up with solutions. And, and transportation was high on the governor's agenda. Before we tackle that in the Medicaid expansion, Stephen, talk to me a little about, about education. Common Core was, was a theme up here and the fact that the legislature <coughs> was not moving forward with that, with money for that in the budget. What kind of influence do you think what happened here in talking about education will be back down in Lansing? Well, I mean, I would hope that, that uh, the people who are holding out on Common Core would have heard Jeb Bush, uh, Michelle Rhee, you know, a Republican and a Democrat who, who both talked, I thought, quite eloquently about why Common Core is important and why, why Michigan ought to be on board with that. Uh, it's not a partisan issue per se. It's, it's a quality issue. Uh, it's a standards issue. Um, and, and I think that was the point, right? Uh, you bring all these people from across the spectrum here. They all are sort of saying the same thing about some of these issues. It's, it's a, a question of getting Michigan, you know, synced up on And I was lobbied very heavily up here on Common Core, and people made some good arguments. We've been cool to Common Core because we are not certain we're not cracking the door to another No Child Left Behind, in which people were badly burned on, particularly in Michigan, uh, were badly burned on that federal program. We want assurances that standards won't turn into mandates, won't into turn into yet another massive government 
federal government bureaucracy and a deeper role in local education. And I think a lot of lawmakers um, want that too. It's, it's easy to dismiss them as wacko Tea Party cranks, but they have some legitimate concerns here that need to be dr addressed. Nobody disagrees with the standards. Nobody disagrees that we need more regular, rigorous education or not, not many people disagree with that. You need insurances that this is not going to become another massive the, federal intrusion well, but the in the federal the, government. Okay, but the difference between this and NCLB was that NCLB put it all out there on, uh, mm -hmm. uh, up front. It was a, a much more aggressive, now I happen to support it, but it, it was a much more aggressive attempt to mandate uh, what happens in schools. There's nothing in Common Core that even approaches that. And so, uh, and, and I'll agree the, with you the there, the but there needs from? to be insurances that this is not going to be creep, as, as federal government programs tend to creep both in their mission and their cost. And that's the concern, and, we're looking and it's at, legitimate. We're looking at a fair amount of s states that already support this. And 46. This. Mm -hmm. 46. I thought another interesting uh, storyline coming from the conference and talking about education is you continue to see the foundations front and center with, uh, with um, giving money. And we talked about uh, almost $60 million given to the EA. Uh, mm -hmm. so they can operate coming from the state. Again, uh, the money coming from these foundations is a continuing storyline, whether they're helping in the city of Detroit, but they are really a large part of this conference as well. And, you know, the, the, a backstory of that is for a number of years, the foundations couldn't give because their portfolios were suffering during the re recession and the steep um, uh, stock market plunge. Stock market has been roaring back. These foundations are now flush with money again, and you're starting to see the impact, and they're starting to spend it a lot more strategic strategically, rather than going down a willy-nilly list of whoever asked them for cash, they're target, targeting their money. And, and you have a lot of folks up here interested in education, interested in Detroit's redevelopment, and interested in sort of pooling their money, different foundations pooling their money to make the biggest impact. Stephen, everyone's talking about Medicaid expansion in the state of Michigan, and people are constantly were telling me, how can we make this happen? It seems to be a no-brainer in terms of what it can help in terms of impacting this state and bringing money back if you've got healthier people, but people are concerned about what happens when the federal government no longer funds it and we have to pay for some of it. Sure, well, I mean, first of all, uh, from my standpoint, I don't have a problem paying for this. This is, this is an investment up front that lowers costs in the long run. The reason that health, one of the reasons that healthcare costs as much as it does in this country is because you got so many people who are uninsured, they are you know, getting their primary care in the emergency rooms or not at all. Uh, th they cost more than everybody else. This is a, an attempt to get a lot of those people, 400,000 in Michigan, insured. I'd pay for it uh, up front. But you know, uh, the With deal. Whose money would you uh, pay for it, Steve? Well, I, I'd raise taxes to pay for it. I think that's something that, that's worth paying raise for. Raise taxes, pay for that. Raise taxes, pay for roads. Pretty soon you're California, you're watching your business and your, your population uh, well, base. Well, you don't look pay any taxes as it is. Quit complaining about that. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> uh, the med what, what, will what it'll take to get the Medicaid expansion passed is an absolute ironclad guarantee that when the federal money goes away, the program goes away if it doesn't become self sustaining. Because if it doesn't, we're going to make some extremely hard, have to make some extremely hard choices about spending, and the chances are education and everything else will take a severe are hit. They, are they working on that guarantee? Is there something? I don't works? know if it's possible that the way the bill is written to give that guarantee. It, it, and so legislators can't. are rightly worried about paying for this thing up the road. Last well, word on Medicaid. I mean, here's the thing: if you don't take this money, that's two hundred million dollars more that you're spending every year uh, over the next five years to make up for the gap. The idea of giving up essentially $200 million return to the state's general fund about, and, and this is about politics. They but just it could, don't like the Affordable it, Care Act. It's absolutely I, not. It could cost us $500, billion, $500 million a year when the federal uh, subsidy runs out. Where do we get that money? The most likely place is education. five years to figure it out. All right, and that will have to be the last word. So <laughs> let's talk a little bit about politics. There was a debate here last night on Mackinac Island. It was four mayoral candidates all running for the job of mayor of the city of Detroit. Go ahead and take a listen. We don't want to threaten the citizens of the city of Detroit with letting loose criminals. How about letting loose some of your appointees? Oh, well, that's fine, but don't, <laughs> I don't have 41 appointees. If, in fact, you did, you said you're an accountant, if you could count. Uh, <laughs> we, we, I, I don't have 41 appointees. I actually, uh, the difference between my agency and others is that we have people who are 
in what are determined uh, appointee positions than in other agencies of civil service. So they have to be there. They're under a court order. I couldn't get rid of them if I wanted to. We've got a huge retiree health issue, which is the way we ought to be talking about this. And we could not possibly be running our retiree health care more inefficiently than we are. I think we can sit down with the employees and make a significant impact on this by working on this constructively. But I can tell you, the finances of Detroit today aren't nearly as dreary as what I walked into in DMC in 2004, and we sat down together, workers and management together, and worked it out. Well, let me well, tell let's, you, they're much yeah, worse right, than ahead. that. I sit on the Appropriations Committee of the House of Representatives, and that is the Budget Committee. I deal with a $56 billion budget. And when you have $380 million projected budget for next month, that is horrible. And then when you juxtapose that next to it with a, with a $16 billion deficit, and people want to quibble about the money, if you don't have $16 billion to pay the bill, you're still in debt. First of all, you have to manage your debt. Debt is not something that you fear, it's something that you manage. The past 40 years in terms of those who have been in charge, those who have been a part of administrations who have helped to get us in this financial position that we're in today, are responsible for that. But how do you proceed responsibly in addressing the issue? Number one, before you go selling off assets, assets are something that puts money into your pocket. But you have to deal with the deficit that's running in the general fund. You do that by allocating costs over to the program funds pulling down federal dollars. So the less money I have running through my general fund, the less of a deficit. That's what we've done for a long time. Your assumption is that you're going to get the federal dollars. The problem you is the federal proceed, government is in just as much trouble. You cannot trouble proceed with, as with a if trillion dollar not going debt. to happen. I'm proceeding as if it is so. I believe that when people do things wrong, that they should, they should suffer for. That's why on three occasions, I asked the federal government to come into my administration and take a look at it. Because when you've done nothing wrong, you don't fear the FBI and the Justice Department. When drugs came up missing from my property room, they came in, did the investigation, the responsible parties all got arrested. Our, uh, our uh, internal auditing system alerted us to it. We did something about it. When we had people who cheated on a promotional exam, we asked the feds to come in and take a look at it, and people went to prison. When we had uh, the third time I did the cheating, it was another time. I can't remember the other one right now. But I asked all three times. When, when we discovered that there are things that are wrong through the mechanisms that we have in place, we put people in jail. That's what I do. So if you're talking about ethics and integrity, I'll stack that up against anybody. Because my administration is always open and open to anybody to look at. Nobody invites the feds into their house if they aren't, if they aren't clean. Because you can look at whoever you want to look at once you come in. Listen, as someone who is a trained auditor, a CPA, right? A CPA, a certified <laughs> public accountant. So let me just break down what I did over my 18-year career. As a certified public accountant, I was responsible for performing audits to audit the integrity of the financials that were be being presented to the public. Now, when we speak about the turnaround that took place at DMC, I applaud you for your efforts, and I love when I'm driving up I-75, I can see the new children's hospital. That is the result. But what we, look, what we have to begin to examine is how did we get to that result. DMC had a $700 million def debt on its book. Not a deficit, but a debt. Mm -hmm. They weren't able to manage their cash. They were in the black, but by your own words in a mission, you were struggling. So Vanguard extended that safety net, if you will, and bought the DMC out. However, again, as an auditor, I look for contingencies, things that we have to fully disclose in the financial statements before a deal can be closed. Before that deal could close, it was reported by Cranes that the DMC had to pay out $30 million in, for anti-kickback uh, violations. So as an auditor, I would caution my client and say, we can't close this deal until this is being addressed. So in full disclosure, Candidate Duggan, can you address that for sure. us? Sure. Well, let, let's tell the truth, all right? We started with uh, a system that had lost $500 million in five years. The board had voted to close receiving, had voted to close Hutzel, and the place was on the verge of bankruptcy. We made money seven years in a row through the efforts of the 14,000 men and women at DMC, and we struck a deal with a national company to put $850 million in. The structure of that deal was that 
DMC was going to keep old liabilities, Vanguard was going to form a new company. A few months before the deal was to close, the feds advised us they'd change the regulation nationally, and it was no longer going to allow Vanguard to form a new company. It meant they had to assume all past liabilities. Nobody had begun to audit it. We were getting near closing. We were about to lose the $850 million investment in this community. And the most complex thing in any hospital system are the so-called Stark Laws. That is not a criminal issue, it's a civil issue, and our obligation to keep track of what we pay doctors is enormous. I had 2,500 doctors, seven years of history, and I went to the feds and said, can you send your auditors in under the self-disclosure law and come in and give us a clean bill of health on all these things? So what I think a lot of the candidates were trying to do is show what kind of financials that they have and the ability to deal with financial problems and the deal, ability to that deal, I think, with, I mean. with, uh, with higher authorities <laughs> like the feds. Because when you're looking at Detroit and the situation that they are in right now, they're going to have to come in, whoever wins this race, and work with Kevin Orr. They are, and I think that was the point uh, Lisa House was trying to make in challenging Duggan, who is billing himself as a financial whiz, a turnaround expert, and I think she, she was uh, trying to tear that down. Similar exchange at a different point with Benny Napoleon over his budget. We asked him, well, gosh, you overspend your budget every year. Why um, should we believe you can manage the city's budget? Of course, he blamed Bob Fagano for shortening him out. But, uh, you know, it, it is a key question because when Kevin Orr is gone, these folks are going to have to balance a checkbook. Can they do it? All right. And so you guys were the moderators of this. We were. Did you that was my big bald head. You kept looking <laughs> at it. We there. saw it. Um, <laughs> did you get the answers that you were looking for, Stephen? I don't think so. I, th I think they did a really good job of not answering most, yeah. most of the questions. It was, it was quite a bit of work for the two of us to uh, to keep them focused and keep Spore them on the topic uh, that we'd asked about. They all want to talk about something else. Uh, I, I also think, you know, they didn't want to get into it too much. Uh, there's going to be more debates uh, over the summer. I think that's when we'll see a little more uh, actual conflict come out, uh, more ideas, substantive and, ideas. And they agreed mm -hmm. beforehand. Duggan and Napoleon agreed beforehand not to mix it up, to save that for after the primary. They're making the assumption they're going to get the nomination. At one point, Duggan chimed in on something uh, uh, negative for Benny, and Benny said, oh, you join in the chorus, Mike? Mm -hmm. You know, like you're breaking the deal. And then, you know, for the rest of the night, they were, you know, really defending each other, which was a strange yeah. thing yeah. to witness. I, I mean, I do think that, that uh, one of the surprises out of the debate for some people, I think, uh, if you didn't know Lisa House, if you didn't know Fred Durhall before that, I think you got a good idea of how knowledgeable both of them are yeah. about the issues in the city and how they have a very firm uh, uh, grasp of the policy uh, implications of all those And things. even though they have not been polling high, it was nice to hear what they had to say if you hadn't been able to get to any of the uh, candidate forums that have been happening already in the city of Detroit. So let's go ahead and talk about Detroit because you can't come up to Mackinac w without Detroit still being a huge part of the conversation. Big I part. mean, looking at where we were last year and then coming back here now that we have um, Kevin Orr, the next couple of weeks are going to be pivotal, you think, Nolan? Well, I think um, Andy Dillon said in, in our newspaper today that um, in a month we'll know uh, where we're headed, whether we're headed to bankruptcy court or whether we're, ho we're headed to a deal that will avoid bankruptcy court. And it all depends on the effectiveness of Kevin Orr over the next month in negotiating with the creditors the unions on the pension funds, the banks on the bond debt. And if he's successful in getting them to bring down that debt to a manageable level, might void bankruptcy cut court. If not, by July, August, we'll be sitting in, in federal court with this. What are people telling you, Stephen, and what's your gut on this? Well, I, I know that, that Kevin Orr has put together a very comprehensive plan for restructuring everything, not just the debt, but, but some of the other obligations and dealing with assets and things, and then they're supposed to, to get that plan to all the stakeholders uh, by mid-month. If everybody agrees to the terms laid out in that, in that document, then I think he thinks we can avoid bankruptcy. But if you get one party, uh, you know, the unions, the, 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 the creditors, uh, the asset holders, uh, anybody who says, I don't want to do it, I think it might force his hand and bankruptcy becomes the only option. And, it, and I think that's why you had the governor not issuing any kind of definitive statement up here that it'll be hands off the DAIA collections. Because if people start rolling up in a ball and saying, you can't touch this, you can't touch that, it's not going to stop that with the DIA, DIA. It'll be everybody saying you can't touch us and pretty soon uh, there's no place to get any money and you're in bankruptcy court. Well, let's talk about that because the possibility 
reality of that has been what everyone has been talking about mm -hmm. also up here on Mackinac, even to the point where in, in, in the Senate, they proposed a bill that would protect the DIA from being able and to. And that's as worthless as the paper it'll be printed on because uh, there are there are bankruptcy rules and laws. And once that thing, you know, they, Detroit had a chance to protect this asset and didn't. At this point, it's too late. Once it gets in the bankruptcy court, the court will decide what's touchable well, and what's I actually, not. I actually, I don't, I don't actually agree with that. Mm -hmm. uh, bankruptcy in in Chapter Nine bankruptcy, they can't force you to sell assets. The asset sales come before you get into bankruptcy. Okay. Mm -hmm. So th where your creditors say you're not bankrupt, you're not insolvent, you got this asset. I want you to do something with it. I think this bill could protect the DIA, and under that circumstance, before they get into court. Um, from from selling and all the bill says is that the museum will abide by uh, the the accreditation rules that that all museums abide by, which prevents you from selling art for anything other than other than acquired I, doubt, art. I doubt the governor would sign that. I yeah, I don't know. He might not. I doubt the governor signed that. I think he's he's focused on the legal process and he's not going to do anything that would put the uh, city in a worse bargaining position. It's going to be interesting to see what happens in the mm -hmm. next couple of weeks. But um, as we end on kind of a political note and talking about the governor. Mark Schauer came out this week and said he was running for governor, so that's our first kind of peak at the gubernatorial race that we're looking at in the next uh, year or so. How you spell that name? Is that <laughs> yeah. S -H -O -W? No one keeps making getting, fun no, of him. No, no, no. We're getting to know Mark Schauer, <laughs> and you better believe he said he's going to be crisscrossing the state and oh, knocking I on bet. as many doors as possible because he does not have that name recognition, which I well, think is going to be a big deal. Who knew who Rick Snyder was in the fall of 2009 when he started running? But he had $7 million to money, get a start. Yeah, well, that helps. And, and, and money and helps. And Mark Schauer's Mark got Schauer a buck 95, that? you know, <laughs> so he's going to be riding a bus across the state. He might have a 10 spot, Nolan. Come on. But I think that he you does. You see him out there with pig he pick him up, get him to his next spot. <laughs> but doesn't this really show, Nolan, Stephen, that the Democrats are getting their act together? The Democrats Early. had one Hang candidate. on, I'm asking Stephen first now. You're bit. negative here. Uh, it shows that right now they understand that the, the best path for them is not to have an extended uh, primary fight that would distract them from raising money to beat Rick Snyder. Good play, uh, smart move. The Republicans will probably have to try to do the same thing in the Senate race. No one's always making fun of the Democrats for not having a candidate for governor. Republicans don't really have a candidate for Senate either. They won't admit that. But Terry Lynn did, Land announcing well, neither Monday. one of them beat Gary Peter. All Terry, right. Who knows? But you know, you you can't Last word. credit the Democrats for coalescing behind the only candidate who expressed an interest in the race. All they right. had no Stupid. choice. Well, we've been having a lot of fun discussing a lot of different topics, and we had a lot of fun last night. Michigan Media Solutions hosted an off-the-record night for journalists and everyone here, hosted by Stephen and Nolan. So go ahead and take a look at you know, uh, some of the... Off the record, should have meant no cameras. <laughs> some, should have meant a little bit uh, some of the fun. So go ahead and ta take a look. We're gonna, we, we've got cartoonists here tonight from both papers. My guy is Henry Payne. Henry, hold this up. This is the last piece of art Henry will ever draw for the Detroit News. He is fired. And uh, the cartoonist on the staff at the Free Press, a very close friend of mine, is Mike Thompson. Mike, can you hold up your likeness of me? Now, now, they have been talking about whether we have to sell assets out of the DIA to cover Detroit's debt. I'm saying maybe this is where the money is. We can sell this picture and get what? 15, 16 billion, right? <laughs> it, was a, it was a great night uh, last night. That was a great picture. I think it was a good, pi good pictures of both of you guys, yeah. right? Oh, come on. Oh, wow. <laughs> and we got you uh, drinking some bourbon, right? Never. No. Nope. <laughs> No, uh, that's, that's what we needed me. a camera of the uh, shots yeah. of. That's Christy not me. with the shot glass. All right, in the couple seconds that, that we have left, um, take away from the island. What are we going to still be talking about six months from now that we're, we're taking away from Mackinac? Well, I think we're still, you know, six from months from now, we'll have a lot more clarity on what, on Detroit's future and what course it's going to take, and that will be heavily, that will heavily inf influence next year's agenda. So, you know, I think right now we've set the stage for a year from now to come back and talk about Detroit 
post-emergency manager. All right, it's going to be interesting. What about you? I think education uh, going forward, does all of this momentum that they tried to build up here translate into policy uh, over the next six months in the legislature? Common Core is one thing, but we've also got important teacher evaluation system coming. There's a fight over that still, how to do it, when to do it. Uh, all of these things that are, that are sort of brewing, can we get them done, can we get them in place? Yeah, that's the important thing, making that talk turn into action. Thanks so much, gentlemen, Thank for you. being here. It's always good to see you and have a safe travel off the island. You too. See you back in Detroit. You got it. And finally tonight, the Under the Radar Michigan crew has been with us on the island for the past few days. And of course, when you think of heading up north, you think of the Mackinac Bridge. But very few people have actually had the view of the bridge like this. You know, so many of us have driven across the mighty Mackinac Bridge, looked up at those incredible suspension towers and wondered, what's it like up there? Well, I'm still wondering because there ain't no way I'm going up there. But recently, Jim Edelman from Under the Radar, Michigan, took the challenge, went into a little teeny elevator, climbed 11 billion ladders, and actually went to the top and made us very proud. To say it's scary at the top of these suspension towers is a frightening understatement all by itself. You're almost 600 feet above the Straits of Mackinac, standing on a platform that's about 20 feet long and only 6 feet wide, with a railing no higher than your waist. And when you add in the 40 mile an hour winds, sounds to me like the scariest environment imaginable. The fact that Jim said he wasn't scared even scares me. If you can get past your natural instinct to survive, the views are absolutely spectacular. You can see hundreds of miles of beautiful Michigan sky and lake shore, and the cars and trucks below look like little toys. It's a surreal place where your senses are heightened and time actually seems to stand still. As for me, well, I just wasn't man enough to go up there. I know it's incredible and has great views, but all I can say is thank goodness they picked Jim, because if they had picked me, I'd still be crying. <laughs> I agree. Great job, guys, and that is going to do it for us tonight. For full coverage of the policy conference, please go to myvote.org. You'll be able to see all of the sessions on demand, key interviews you might have missed in all of our shows. Thanks so much for joining us. A big thanks to the Grand Hotel for having us and for our great crew from Detroit Public Television who made it all happen. Good night from Mackinac Island.